Hey, this is Mr. Spencer, and I want to summarize the last part of the book, chapter 16 through 26, and also talk a little bit about types of conflict and the point of view so far of the book. You've read the first part of the book, right? You should have read past page 100 into chapter 14 and 15. Did you read about the pimp? Okay, let's, let's review a little bit, and then we'll summarize. Fast forward, rewind, pause, do what you want. What are some of the big thematic ideas in The Catcher in the Rye? Authenticity versus artificiality. Holden is keenly sensitive to people that are phony or fake, artificial, people that like put on a show, they're posers. He wants something real, something authentic, which is hard to find in this world. There's also this sort of struggle thematically between conformity trying to fit in, and resistance to conformity. Are you going to be a sheep? Are you going to just fit in with the herd? Or are you going to stand out and be an individual? Okay, This is a tough question for any young person, and Holden's right at that age where he's starting to struggle with it. Corruption in the adult world. Life sucks. Adults can be terrible, and Holden is starting to realize this, and it's overwhelming for him. And the perception of truth is something he's also having a little bit of trouble with. He talks to adults and his teachers, but many of them seem corrupted. So he's not really sure who has a perception of truth in the world. And he's noticed his values are changing over time. Younger people and older people in his life, their values seem to change. Sometimes they don't practice what they preach and they're hypocritical. So Holden struggles with that as well. The novel's central conflict may best be described as between Holden and the adult world. I think this is due to Holden's unwillingness to become part of this world because most adults he knows are phonies. So why would he want to participate in this big fake machinery? His dramatic confrontations with other people always seem to be with the corrupted phony people like Stradlater or Maurice, oh, the pimp. He doesn't seem to have confrontations with people he thinks are real and authentic, but he definitely has physical altercations, violent confrontations with people he considers phony. The point of view of the novel is first person limited. We're only seeing the novel through Holden's eyes. If we had the point of view of other characters, we might have a different perspective on it. But that also kind of goes back to this idea of the perception of truth. Okay. Stream of consciousness is another part of the point of view. There's many digressions, sort of random, rambling rants that Holden goes on. The stream of consciousness is like a river. It's just Holden's thoughts flowing, unimpeded. There's no rocks. There's no dam. There's nothing stopping the flow of the river of his mind. And we're right inside of his mind with that first person point of view. Another word is called dialect. The term is for slang language used in a book. It's not formal language, so a lot of the informal language you see in the book is called dialect. This is a New York teenager in the 1940s. If we had maybe a teenager living in England in the 1990s, they'd have a different dialect. If we had an Australian person living in 2020, they'd have a different dialect. Okay, so the accent of Holden is this upper class, uh, 1940s, teenage slang. And that's what caused a lot of controversy about the book over the years. The bad language, the B words, the G, D words, the F words. It creates a very believable character, I hope you feel. Or, or do you disagree and think Holden's just as phony and artificial as the ones he hates? Is that intended by the author? That would be pretty ironic. Do you think the author's being ironic there? Is Holden phony, or do you think Holden is just as authentic as anybody could be? He's searching for, essentially, Holden's on a quest. Do you understand what I mean? Some of these are similar to Chris McCandless from Into the Wild, right? Holden's looking for three things. He's on a quest for the innocence he had from childhood. He wants things to remain the same as when he was younger. Like everybody, he's on a quest for love, but he sort of confuses that sometimes with sex. Where is the love of his parents? Where is his mother and father? That's where most people get love in their life, right? His parents don't seem to be in the book thus far. And he's on a search and a quest for identity. 
What do you do with your life? What does all this mean? How do I live up to the expectations of my parents, society, expectations of myself, and still be an individual without becoming a victim of conformity? Some good questions to think about. So types of conflicts in the book, you get this person versus person conflict. He actually gets in verbal fights and physical fights with people. Person versus the supernatural. We might think of the supernatural as God or fate. Person versus nature. Okay, The, the natural world around him could be weather elements. It could be human nature, which then takes us to this other type of conflict, a person versus himself. A, a very, very interesting, introverted, philosophical conflict. Holden struggling to find his own identity. Is he phony? Is he authentic? He struggles with this in his own mind. You probably do too. Admit it. And person versus technology it could be in a science fiction movie, but we're not talking about robots. We're not talking about um, Fast and the Furious with cars here. Even though he rides in taxi cabs and gets on trains throughout the book, you might consider technology just like modern cities, the technology that creates something like New York City, the technology that allows someone to build the skyscrapers and the huge booming economy of New York City. Holden's almost swallowed up by it at times. Okay, Technology doesn't just mean electronics. Technology is anything man-made and invented, and New York City is full of man-made inventions. Okay, And then a person versus society. How does he fit in with the social framework that surrounds him? So those are some of the conflicts. Which conflict do you think is most central to Holden's story? Which one do you think? Bring it up for discussion in class or consider it as you finish reading the book here. Got a conflict wheel as you sort of think about all stories, all books, all movies, even your own life story is going to have to deal with these conflicts. Which one are you struggling with the most in your life? This one here, person versus himself. Are you struggling with person versus society? Or is it person to person? What conflict is most central to Holden's story? Okay, we'll summarize now chapters 1 through 15. I already did a video going over this, and it ends with Holden wanting to call up Sally Hayes. And a pimp, Maurice, has just roughed him up and I think done something violent below the belt to Holden. Okay, his brother, DB, is a writer in Hollywood. His other brother, Ali, died of leukemia two years ago, we learned. Instead of going back to his parents' house after being expelled from school, Holden describes his anxious impressions of his teachers, classmates, and random strangers he meets on the train, in taxi cabs, nuns, in a deli, even a pimp and the prostitute, Sonny, in the hotel. After the pimp roughs him up, Holden keeps thinking about an old childhood friend, Jane. She kept her kings and checkers in the back row. But instead of calling Jane, he's too nervous and he calls up a girl he sort of has gone on dates with before the very pretty and attractive sally hayes holden is lonely and he's nervous since leaving the school that he's been expelled from but he gives old sally a call so the morning after the sunny and maurice the pimp incident holden makes a date with a girl he's dated in the past sally he isn't particularly fond of sally's personality but she's quite attractive He's lonely. He simply wants some company. The prostitute didn't work out so well. He just wanted to talk to her, ends up getting beat up. In an ideal world, Holden would call his childhood friend Jane, but every time he considers contacting her, he decides that he isn't in the right mood. So chapter 16 continues with some time to kill before his afternoon date with Sally. He wanders around town, eventually hearing a boy sing a song while coming out of church. If a body catch a body coming through the rye, the youngster sings. And it touches Holden emotionally with her innocent voice and the beauty of the song. Hoping to find his younger sister, Phoebe, Holden walks all the way to the Museum of Natural History, thinking that her class, his sister, they might be there on a field trip. On his way, he thinks about how much he loves the museum because its exhibits never change. A person can go time and time again to the museum, he thinks, and the only thing that will change over time is the individual visiting the exhibits. But he sees the dinosaurs, the skeletons, the woolly mammoths, the wax figures there in the museum. They stay the same forever. Holden likes that. See if you can read into the subtext of that theme. When he finally reaches the museum, though, Holden finds that, well, he can't get in. 
who takes a taxi to go meet Sally Hayes. Will he be able to get back into that museum? So he gets in the taxi, and in chapter 17, he has this date with Sally. It does not go well. The play that they see annoys Holden. He thinks they're all phony, as does the fact that Sally talks to a boy Holden thinks is phony. Afterwards, they go ice skating, and Holden has a hard time enjoying his outing. He keeps looking at her posterior. He thinks she's super attractive, but he's wondering the whole time whether or not Sally only wanted to go skating because she knew she'd be able to wear one of those skimpy dresses that the skating rink lets girls wear while they're on the ice. She's showing off her rear end. That's what he says. Once they finish skating, they go into a bar restaurant near the rink and Holden begins to talk about everything he hates, ranting and raving. He even asks Sally, run away with me to a cabin in New England or Vermont or Massachusetts, dreaming of a life of total freedom. Unfortunately for him, though, this fantasy comes crashing down on him when Sally refuses his invitation and she asks him to sh stop shouting. He says he isn't shouting at her. And uh, the date is going off the deep end. Frustrated by the lack of connection or chemistry on the date, Holden insults Sally. He calls her a royal pain in the you-know-what. But when Sally begins to cry and asks Holden to leave, he gladly obliges, though he feels extremely depressed after this terrible interaction. After spending time with Sally, Holden calls a former classmate named Carl Luce. So Carl Luce... Before he goes and visits Carl, though, he wonders to himself about war at the end of chapter 18. Remember J.D. Salinger was in the war? I wonder if the subtext of this book features a lot of violence and almost like a war story, a metaphor of a war novel. Anyway, he says there at the end of chapter 18, I swear if there's another war ever, they better just take me out and stick me in front of the firing squad. I wouldn't object. What gets me about D.B., his brother, though, he hated the war so much, and yet he got me to read this book of Farewell to Arms last summer. He said it was so terrific. That's what I can't understand. It had this guy in it named Lieutenant Henry that was supposed to be a nice guy and all. And I don't see how D.B. could hate the army and war and all so much and still like a phony like that. Holden loved The Great Gatsby, though. Old Gatsby, old sport, that killed me. The Great Gatsby, that's a good book. So, Carl Luce, he goes to visit him in chapter 19. He's three years older than Holden, and he goes now to Columbia University at a school that Holden had previously been kicked out of. Carl and him were classmates, but Carl's older. Holden never actually liked him, but he asks him if he wants to have dinner together. Uninspired by the invitation, because Holden might be kind of an annoying guy. And the last time Holden saw Luce, Holden called him a phony. Luce agrees tentatively to meet him late that night for drinks. When he arrives, though, he declares that he doesn't want to have a typical Caulfield conversation. But Holden is incapable of restraining himself because he's had multiple scotch and sodas. And because he's getting drunk, Holden asks Carl Luce a number of intrusive, invasive questions about his sex life, eventually driving him away, at which point Holden walks to Central Park to look at the ducks in the lagoon. There's no ducks, though, and it's freezing, and he imagines his own death, which Holden knows would make his sister Phoebe miserable. So, thinking along these lines, he decides to go home and visit his sister. You should read this if you haven't, right? You've already read the pages. Stop the video. Okay. Finish reading chapter 19. Read chapter 20. There are 26 total chapters. Guys, finish them. Okay? I'm just here to help you after you've read. Holden stays in chapter 20 at the Wicker Bar, and he gets drunk. At one point, he gets the waiter's attention, asks him to invite the French singer to have a drink with him, but he doubts the waiter will actually deliver the message. He stays at the bar real late, thinking of calling Jane, who keeps her checker kings in the back row, but too nervous. Finally, at one in the morning, he stumbles outside while pretending he's been shot in the stomach. He's so drunk, he nearly convinces himself that he's bleeding, and he staggers into a phone booth where he thinks once more about calling Jane... But he calls Sally, who we went ice skating with earlier, instead. It's after one in the morning, and it infuriates both Sally and her grandmother that he calls so late. Unbothered by Sally's annoyance, he informs her multiple times that he'll come over and help her trim the tree on Christmas Eve. Holden's drunk. So, next part of chapter 20, he walks to Central Park to check on the ducks again in the lagoon. On his way, he drops the record 
he bought for Phoebe, little Shirley Beans. He's going to give it to his sister. He starts crying again, scooping up the broken pieces and putting them in his jacket pocket. When he finally reaches the park, he sees the lagoon is partially frozen and there's no duck swimming in the water. So he makes his way to a bench and he sits down freezing because his head is still wet from plunging it into a sink at the wicker bar before. He is not doing well physically in his health. Thinking it might catch pneumonia and die, he imagines his own funeral, which reminds him that he missed Allie's funeral because he was still in the hospital after smashing the garage windows with his bare hand. So after envisioning his own death, Holden thinks of how awful Phoebe would be if he died of pneumonia. So he decides to go see her, and he knows going home is risky because he might get caught by his parents, and he suspects they'll be asleep. So he plans to slip in and out without seeing them. It's late at night. Holden manages to snap out of this morbid fantasy about death by focusing on his sister Phoebe, or more specifically on his relationship with Phoebe, which is one of the only things in his life that gives him a sense of belonging, acceptance, and love. A little bit of analysis here. You understand this? So we move into chapter 21 and 22. Holden sneaks into his family's apartment. He wakes up Phoebe. He tells her he's leaving to go live on a ranch in Colorado. Really, dude? Sounds like Red Dead Redemption fantasy. Phoebe correctly guesses that Holden has been kicked out of yet another school when she continues to scold Holden for failing out of Pensy prep. He then asks her to stop trying to make him feel bad telling her that everyone at Pensy is mean and that it's a terrible place. And he says that even the nice teachers were still phonies. Was Mr. Spencer a phony? Ugh. And he tells her about how Mr. Spencer used to act completely different whenever the headmaster, Dr. Thurmer, sat in on his classes. Phoebe interrupts Holden and accuses him of never liking anything. When he argues the point, she challenges him to name one thing he genuinely likes. At first, he dithers. He can't think of anything. Asking if he has to think of something that he likes or something that he likes a lot. Stop stalling, bro. When she says that he has to think of something he likes a lot, he has trouble answering. While thinking about if there's anything he actually likes, Holden's mind wanders to the nuns he met that morning. You notice most of the story wanders like Holden's mind. It also wanders to James Castle, who was a boy at Elkton Hills, a school that Holden used to go to, who committed suicide while Holden was also a student there. Holden didn't know James Castle very well, but he remembers him because Castle jumped out of a window after a group of boys tried to get him to take back something he said about one of them. Unwilling to take back his insult, James Castle flung himself out of the window and died. Finally, to answer Phoebe's question about if Holden actually likes anything, Holden says that he likes Allie and talking to Phoebe. Phoebe, for her part, says this doesn't count because Allie's dead. But Holden says this shouldn't matter since Allie was nicer than anyone he's ever met. Phoebe asks near the end of chapter 22, what Holden wants to do in life? His little sister asking her older brother. A little ironic. You'd think it'd be the other way around. And Holden says he'd like to be a catcher in the rye. It's similar to the lyrics that the boy was singing in chapter 16. It was a kid, but I was mistaken. Yeah, it was definitely a boy. I was thinking wrong about that. So go back to chapter 16 and look at that slide. But this was the song lyrics from an old Robert Burns poem. And Holden's kind of misremembering the lyrics. But in the lyrics... He thinking he could rescue children by catching them before they fall off a steep cliff at the edge of a giant rye field that he's been envisioning recently. Holden's fantasy about becoming the catcher in the rye, it's rather abstract and surreal, but it spotlights his desire to preserve what little innocence he has left in the world. To him, children represent this purity, inevitably, that recedes and declines as you grow older. And for this reason, Holden wants to protect this purity from corruption. And he wishes he could spend all of his time keeping the hardships of the adult world at bay. Okay, you can look in your book and see this for yourself. It's on page 191. Check in your book, page 191. It is the title of the book. It's pretty good stuff. You've read this, right? You're watching my summary video after you've read the chapter. It is English class. Okay, open up your book. I'm going to continue.
summarizing what you've already read. So in chapter 23, while he's home, Holden calls Mr. Antolini, his favorite teacher who used to teach English at Elkton Hills, Holden's formal school where that James Castle committed suicide. Mr. Antolini is upset to hear that Holden has been kicked out of school once again, and he tells him to come over right away if he wants. Holden likes Mr. Antolini because when that James Castle died and fell out of the window, Antolini took his jacket off and covered up James Castle. So before Holden leaves his house with Phoebe, he asks Phoebe to dance with him. He lectures her not to smoke, ironically, and she wants to go with him as he leaves, but he won't let her. So he, she gives him all of her money to take, $8.85. You got to read this. Suddenly Holden starts to cry. He gives Phoebe his red hunting hat, then he sneaks out of the apartment, making his way to his former teacher's house, Mr. Antolini. So we're nearing the climax of the book, don't you think? There's 26 chapters. Here's chapter 24. You read it already, yes? When he arrives, Mr. and Mrs. Antolini greet him fondly, similar to chapter 1. Remember when he goes to Mr. and Mrs. Spencer's house? And then in chapter 2. But now here, Mr. Antolini sits in the living room to talk with Holden about his life. As they discuss his future, Holden begins to feel quite sick, He's feeling a little nauseous. He tries to listen as Mr. Angelini warns him that he's headed for a terrible fall. And he tries to convince Holden to be less rigid and judgmental. Holden listens, but he's too tired to really absorb what Mr. Antolini is telling him. So Mr. Antolini sets up a place for him to sleep on the couch. Remember, Holden's been kind of running around the last three days. He has not slept much at all. He's been smoking like a madman. He's barely eaten anything. Shortly thereafter, Holden abruptly wakes up and he feels Mr. Antolini stroking his head with his hand and thinking that Mr. Antolini is doing something perverted, he leaves. Huh? You can read that on page 212 to 213. Mr. Antolini said, grab your bags, get out of here. I'll leave the door unlatched. Holden's like, yeah, 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 let me get out of here. Okay. He got in the elevator. He's shaking like a madman. Was this traumatic? He was sweating too. What really happened? Was he only petting his head? Why was he petting his head? Holden gets out of there and he says in the book at the end of chapter 24, when something perverty like that happens, I start sweating like a bastard. That kind of stuff's happened to me about 20 times since I was a kid. I can't stand it. What's happened 20 times? Chapter 25, after sleeping on a bench in Grand Central Station for a couple of hours, like Chris McCandless, Holden decides to say goodbye to Phoebe before heading west. If only Chris McCandless would have said goodbye to his sister, Corrine. Anyway, Holden, however, is overcome by a strange but sudden fear that each time he steps off the curb, he'll never get to the other side of the road. And at the very end of the block, he becomes convinced that he's going to descend forever into the street. So he begs Allie, his dead brother, to protect him. Holden decides that the only thing for him to do is leave New York City once and for all. Wanting to say goodbye to Phoebe, he goes to her school and he gives an administrator in the principal's office a note telling her to meet him at the Museum of Art during her lunch break because he's going to move out west once and for all. Okay, chapter 25 continues. This is a longer chapter right near the end of the book. Holden decides that the only thing for him to do is leave New York City once and for all. So he goes to the school, gives the principal the note. While he's at the school, which he used to attend, he begins to feel excited by his plan to head west. However, his spirits sink when he looks up and he sees that someone has scrawled F-U on one of the building's walls. Enraged that somebody would write this where kids like his sister Phoebe, so innocent, could see this. Holden erases the phrase, trying to rub it out, and he fantasizes about killing whomever wrote it. John Lennon? Anyway. Thankfully, though, he wakes up and he goes back to the lobby to find Phoebe, who has arrived with a large suitcase. She informs him that she'll be coming with him, and this forces him to see how absurd his plan is. So instead of following through with this idea... He takes Phoebe to the zoo and watches her ride a carousel. Between rides, she gives him back his hunting hat, and he promises that he won't be going out west. When Phoebe finishes riding the carousel, Holden encourages her to take another ride. You gotta read this. 
read it, chapter 25. Before she does, though, she takes the hunting hat, which Holden put in his pocket, and she places it on her brother's head. She'd asked him if he's really going to move out west, and he assures her that he isn't, promising to go home after they're finished in the park. Happy with this news, she runs back to the carousel. As Holden watches her, he feels so happy he could cry. It's raining. Read the gosh darn ending for yourself. Okay, last chapter. It's only one page long. Holden's story shifts back to a rest home. He's undergoing psychoanalysis. Remember on the first page of the book, he said, I'm going to tell you about some madman stuff that happened last Christmas. So a year has passed, and he's been telling the story, I guess writing it down. He says that he doesn't know whether he'll apply himself when he returns to school. Is he writing this to a psychiatrist? Is it a personal journal? Is it a therapy journal? His brother DB visits Holden quite frequently, he says, and he recently asked how Holden feels about everything that's happened to him in the last few months. But Holden didn't know what to say. After all, he's not really sure what he thinks of the whole ordeal. The only thing he's sure about is that he wishes he hadn't told so many people about what had happened to him once he left Pensy. Oddly enough, he finds himself missing the people in the story he's just told. Even Ackley and Stradlater. He even might miss that gosh damn Maurice. That's what he says on the last page. This Holden says is why people shouldn't talk so much about their lives, because if you do, you start missing everybody. That's the end. What do you think? What will you choose to write about on your final essay? Rewind the video, go back through the summary slides if you want, but you'll get a few choices of what you're going to write about for that final timed writing. This has been Mr. Spencer. Signing off.